What will you get from reading literature? Or, why read literature? I got something to nitpick here. People who say, what will you get from literature? You'll get empathy. As if that's the reason I'm going to read, as if that's gonna make me read. Why does the empathy line make me so angry there? Because heaps of evil people throughout history have been well read. Hitler himself was known to be an avid reader of the classics. And I took this straight from Wikipedia, a Wikipedia article called Adolf Hitler's Private Library. Hitler was extremely well read. He claimed to read at least a book a night. He is said to have believed that Shakespeare was far superior to Goethe and Schiller and apparently was fond of quoting Shakespeare throughout his life. Therefore, reading does not make you more empathetic. It's more complicated than that. But I wrote this before and I want to read it straight as I wrote it. If reading doesn't give you empathy then, what does reading do? Reading increases imagination. Empathy is a faculty of the imagination. Empathy is embodied imagination. So empathy is governed by the imagination, which itself is governed by the will. And thus the will, which is usually shrouded by the unconscious, makes empathy so tribalistic that I claim empathy isn't even a virtue. Doing the right thing is a virtue. Empathy seldom leads to doing the right thing, for the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And empathy more often leads to good intentions instead of good plans. And here's why. If you're clouded with compassion, your aim is to stop all suffering immediately. But a good plan is never pleasant. A good plan requires a small payment of suffering to enact. Why? Because life is suffering and nothing is got for nothing. If you plan to lose weight or simply to get healthy, exercise is that small payment of suffering. If you plan to make money, you must pay for it with work. If you truly had empathy for a child, you would not send them to 12 years of schooling. But that is the price of banishing primordial ignorance. That is the price to live a good life in modern society. However deficient we deem our education system to be. Conclusion. Reading will not make you a good person. You alone can make yourself a good person. The second one that really grinds my gears is when people say studies show reading raises your attention span. Like, uh, no shit, man. I mean, looking at paint dry on a wall for two hours a day will also increase your attention span because basically what they're doing is a zen-like meditation. So you would have to subtract what they get from staring at a wall from reading. And I feel like when you subtract it, then what you're left with is only a little bit of a boost. It might be, it might be the other way around. You might get more attention span from looking at a wall because you're not, you're not receiving pleasure that you are from reading. Basically, my point is much of the attention span gained in the beginning is simply from stepping away from technology and giving yourself space from that world. What then will you get? 10 things you will actually get from reading literature. And number one, I think is the easiest to forget, but first and foremost, pleasure, joy, fun, excitement, exuberance, satisfying sadness and all of the deeper emotions that go along with investigating and entering the sublime. Now these next four come from the literary critic Harold Bloom. I just quoted him verbatim because he just said, he puts it so beautifully, I think from the Charlie Rose show. And Charlie Rose asked him, you know, what will you get from reading literature? And he said, firstly, cognitive power. That is to say an increase in one's own ability to think and one's own ability to talk on the basis of that thinking. Three, rhetorical power, the ability to understand better the uses of metaphor, which according to Aristotle, was the special mark of genius in every one of us. Four, and this is still Bloom, a real capacity for apprehending otherness, for on the one hand, realizing that we are trapped inside our own mortality, and on the other hand, that our only hope of getting beyond that trap of mortality is to have some real sense of other selves. We read many books is the ancient adage. 
because we cannot know enough people. Five, still bloom. It's deeper really than that. Memory is the major element in cognition, in everything that we call the humanities. If you cannot remember, then you can't think, and you can't imagine, and you can't write, and you can hardly read. Okay, that's enough of bloom now. Six, literature will give you wisdom. I mean, I think for much of my youth, the central question inside of me, which I could not articulate, but it was kind of subconscious, I guess, was where shall wisdom be found? And I think many young people can relate. You know, I went to self-help first and saw how hollow that was and it saddened me because I thought that's where I would find wisdom. But then I went to psychology, couldn't find it there. You know, the true wisdom that I was looking for. Then after all these long years, literature. Literature is where civilizations stash and hide the best of their wisdom. It is the treasure trove of each civilization. Seven, it will give you insight into the nature of existence, of the way things are. Eight, literature will give you self-knowledge. And it's a little hard to explicate, but it seems like in two senses, the first sense being that literature is almost like a mirror and can make you realize things about yourself as you read through it. And two, on the second sense, having all of these imaginary instances bound through your mind like particles seems to also unlock knowledge that seemed to be hidden in oneself from the beginning. One might call that the Socratic method of teaching. Nine, a deep intuitive understanding of humans and their behavior. And when I say understanding, I mean it quite literally as standing under, because it seems like literature almost positions you underneath the world of humans so that you're almost looking up through a glass ceiling into say the social world and you're watching people walk around and interact and you're seeing right to the truth of things. And 10, literature will give you poems and paragraphs to chant to yourself in times of need slash boredom or simply for fun. I mean, that's if you memorize. And memorization is a dwindling art form in itself, it seems. I think to summarize, a great way to think of literature is that psychiatry and medicine attempt treatment of the problem, but art and even religion attempt prevention of the problem. What does one have to get to read literature? First and foremost, I think it's good to remind yourself that classics are classics because of first principles. Those first principles being, of course, bow. Beauty, originality, and wisdom, or you can break it down more precisely as aesthetic splendor, cognitive strength, which is originality, because the prerequisite to gain originality is cognitive strength and wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom's always wisdom. I don't know, you can't break that down. It's wisdom, man. What do you do? To, what do you ask for me? Second thing you have to get is figurative language, metaphor, simile, irony, metonymy, synecdoche. Figurative language is, I think, the hardest part, the most difficult part of literature. It, and the reason why most people say, I don't get it. It's the ambiguity sometimes or the inability to penetrate the figurative language. I wanted to give an example. Okay, I got it. The Emperor of Ice Cream by Wallace Stevens. I'll just read the first stanza quickly, just to get the point of figurative language across somehow. It goes, Call the roller of big cigars, the muscular one, and bid him whip in kitchen cups concupiscent curds. Let the wenches dawdle in such a dress as they are used to wear, and let the boys bring flowers in last month's newspapers. Let be be finale of scene. The only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Ooh, isn't that nice? Basically, it's fun to say, but at the first reading, you're like, wait, what does this mean? And of course, the poem is about <laughs> time. It's so hard to explicate poems because 
they're already said perfectly and are trying to deconstruct perfection in some sense to say it in an, in an imperfect way that is also more understandable. All right, let me just quickly go over all the small metaphors in this just to get my point across. First line, call the roller of big cigars. Now, big cigars are here, ice cream cones, and the roller of big cigars is the ice cream man, the muscular one, I was talking about the ice cream man, and bid him whip in kitchen cups, concupiscent curds, concupiscent curds, oof, is ice cream. I mean, what a lovely description for ice cream, <laughs> because there's always something a little central about ice cream. It says, let the wenches dawdle in such dress as they are used to wear, and let the boys bring flowers in la last month's newspapers. You know, let the, let the children do what they want. Now, second to last line of the stanza says, let be be finale of scene. Now the double B there is, is great. Now the first B here is not functioning as a verb. It's functioning as a signifier of itself, basically. It's saying the word be, let the word be be finale of scene. And so you're saying, whatever it seems to be like, let that seeming be its being. But hopefully that makes more sense. Then the last line, the only emperor is the emperor of ice cream. All empires rise and topple over time and all emperors have a lifespan. They must die. So he's saying the true, the truest emperor is the emperor of ice cream. Because if you can experience ice cream in the moment. You've claimed the largest empire that ever was, which is the pure consciousness of being in the moment. And I just realized that the second last line, let be be finale of scene, is an allusion to Hamlet. And I should have put allusions into the list, but allusions are a byproduct of literature, you might say. You don't have to get them to get literature. They're just the little candies on the side that if you pick up, you, ooh, I, illusion, I see. But the illusion here is to when Hamlet says to Hor Horatio, I think Act 5, Horatio says, should I, should I tell them to stop? Or should I tell them to wait? And Hamlet says, not a wit. We defy augury. There is special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. Since no man of aught he leaves knows aught, what is to leave betimes? Let be. And while well, Stevens has parodied that, in a sense, <laughs> he's taken let be. He's not mutilated it, but he's uh, transformed it, transfigured it into something not of equal weight, but of as respectable a sentiment. Stevens is obviously building off of Hamlet, but he's putting the weight of the expression onto experience instead of existence. In the opposition of being and seeming, he says, let be, be finale of seem. <laughs> Third, one also has to get sound and sense, the interplay of sound and sense. Now, it seems adult nowadays, you know, everyone gets the sense of words, but as an adult, you lose the sound of words, the joy of the sound, the deliciousness of the words, and the deliciousness of words is not lost upon children. They have a natural affinity for it. And you know, if you lose that, then you've lost half the sight in a sense. I know just the poem, also Wallace Stevens. You might be able to tell, I really like Wallace Stevens. But it's a poem called Bantams in Pine Woods. And a bantam, yeah, I don't know this, a bantam is a little chicken. Now, what you have to imagine is a little chicken facing, looking up to one of those Aztecs who wore one of those long capes made out of feathers. And basically they come face to face with each other. And the little bantam, is the one speaking, not the chieftain. Chieftain, if you can, of Azcan and Kaftan, of Tan with Henna Hackles, halt! Damned universal cock, as if the sun was blackamoor to bear your blazing tail. 
fat, 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 fat. I am the personal. Your world is you. I am my world. You ten-foot poet among inchlings, fat. Be gone, an inchling bristles in these pines, bristles and points their Appalachian tangs, and fears not portly as can, nor his hooves. The pure joy of sound, that's what you could call the opening of that poem, the chief tan, if you can, of Ascan and Kaftan, of tan with henna hackles, halt! You know, it's this great crescendo that just rises and then hits and then, damn, the universal cock, as if the sun was black and more to bear your blazing tail. Fat, 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 fat! <laughs> But you get the point, right? The sound of words is what gives it the music. Without that rhyming and near rhyming and the consonance and the assonance, it, it gives it all of its flavor. But there's also, instead of just sound, for the joy of sound, sound gives meaning to the sense, in poetry at least. But another one that would be good to show the point. I mean, I was thinking of Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves Did Guy and Gimble in the Wave All Mimsy were the Borrow Groves And the Moan Wraths out grave. All nonsense, wor all nonsense words That gained its meaning from the sound Because even though they're nonsense words We kind of feel what they mean This brings me to the point that When one says stone, and this is Mary Oliver's point in one of her poetry books that you can say stone or rock and they're substantially the same thing but when you say stone you think of a something smooth because you've got this stone right and when you say rock it's got that hard ending and it's got that rising R and when you say rock you think of something more craggy and pointy and dangerous something that you could hit your head on and die. Anyway, I hope you get what I mean. The fourth thing you got to get is the tone of irony and humor. I remember when I first started reading Moby Dick. I remember the first time I read the opening. I didn't understand a single thing that was being said, but even more than that, it was so far from my mind that the narrator in a celebrated classic could actually be being funny right now. And if you've read the opening chapter, of <clears throat> Moby Dick that begins with the famous words call me Ishmael then you know it's incredibly charming I think one of the most charming opening chapters to any book in the classics and while being charming it's also quite funny I mean you have on the first page the image of him feeling so bad and melancholy that he would just as well go through the streets hitting people's hats off their heads then he would throw himself on the sword like Cato. And if you're not paying enough attention, not even paying attention, if you have the preconceived notion that the classics are so serious, they're serious people, and nothing jolly can be, can be had about it. If you have that preconceived notion, then irony and humor just go and you miss it. That's very sad because that's just about every author in the classics is a funny little piece of shit. The fifth thing that one has to get is that what seems like pretentiousness in a classic is usually playfulness, just the author being playful. And we have been conditioned by, I guess, education and the literary critics that these things are pretentious because when they talk about it, it just sounds pretentious all the time. And so when we come to it ourselves and we read it, we go, ugh, it's pretentious. You know, you might give the example of Ulysses by James Joyce. And many people feel that it is incredibly pretentious for good reason. But the whole book is just James Joyce being playful. It kind of harkens back to the great uh, remark by Picasso that to be a great artist, you have to reclaim the childishness within you or the child within you part of the creative spark the majority of the creative spark is this childlike quality within oneself and it is the the motivation to play that 
is the substance of a lot of, not the substance, but the spark of a lot of artistic manifestations. Now six, go slow. It's fine. Nobody's going to shoot you in the back of the head for going slow. I think in this modern age, people think they should be reading fast. And when they read literature, they're like blind men running through a beautifully furnished house, just bumping into things left and right. And then they blame the house for being well furnished. And I know this because I was the same. I thought I had to read fast to be a good reader. Then when you get into literature, you try to read fast and you're just hitting your head against a wall that's always in front of you to really appreciate literature, to get literature. You have to slow down and let the words work upon you, let the characters work upon you. The seventh thing one has to get is that use a dictionary. This actually works. I mean, when I started out, I would come across so many words I didn't know and I thought, yeah, it'll be fine, I won't look it up. And then I would finish the page and not know what's happening. And then one day I thought, why don't I just use a dictionary? And then that one word I didn't know unlocked the whole page for me. The eighth point is theory. What theory? There is no theory except yourself. And I say that because all that glitters is not gold and theories look really cool and dashing and make you sound very suave. But at the end of the day, what substance do they give you? What substance do they give you that you can use in your life as well? The best theory of poetry is the love of poetry. The ninth thing is that deep reading is nothing more than imagination. Now one can read one of two ways. One is read the words, blah, 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 blah done the next page, done the next poem. But you find that, say in a poem like um, Coleridge's Kubla Khan, in Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran, through cabins measureless to man, down to a sunless sea, so twice five miles of fertile ground, with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills, you can read those words and say, not see anything in your mind, but deep reading is to go slowly. And when it says, so twice five miles of fertile ground, you go, okay, twice five miles of fertile ground. I see it with walls and towers were girdled round. Okay. I see it. And there were gardens bright with sinuous rills. I see it where blossomed many an incest bearing tree. I see it. And then this beautiful image starts to bloom in your mind, but in the beginning, it's not, it doesn't happen passively. You have to be active with the author in a sense. They need your participation. And that's part of the joy in it. That's part of the pleasure because it takes you to other worlds. And that's, that is the transport in a sense. That is the vessel through which you get to another world, the vessel of the imagination. Imagination isn't an automatic thing that happens. 10, the final one, misreading. Misreading is a major creative function. Who would have thought? Howard Bloom points out that all great authors creatively misread their precursors. Now, why is misreading an authentic creative function? It's because figurative language is ambiguous and that's part of its beauty. But in that ambiguity, more than one meaning is let in. And if the figurative language, the metaphors are strong, multiple meanings will be strengthened by the metaphor, not just one meaning. And that's how you can tell a good metaphor is if it strengthens more than one meaning and not just the singular meaning that it is used for. In brief, it is the freedom to be beautifully wrong, which is to be accidentally original. Now I want to quickly end with something from by Howard Bloom. The part I wanted to read was the ending of the introduction, wherein Bloom says, there is a reader sublime and it seems the only secular transcendence we can ever attain, except for the even more precarious transcendence we call falling in love. I urge you to find what truly comes near to you that can be used for weighing and for considering. Read deeply, not to believe, not to accept, not to contradict, but to learn to share in that one nature that writes and reads. Beautiful.